Hey everybody, what is going on? Hexlex here with another Master Duel video for you guys. So today we're going to be taking a look at Prey Kids Adventure once again. These are going to be the last games from Stage 1 of the Duelist Cup here with Prank Kids Adventure. I don't really know, again, I think I said this towards the beginning of the Duelist Cup, how much I'm going to really be playing Stage 2 because uh, I tend to be busier during the weekends um, with just IRL stuff and uh, honestly I'm not like too particularly worried about like just, you know, the title from you know, because that's really the only prize you get is like the title, just bragging rights basically, and that's not something that uh, you know particularly interests me. So I think I'm just gonna probably hang it up. I think after this, plus I have some other decks that I want to try, some new decks, some fun decks that uh, um, I'm gonna be playing a little bit more. I'll still be playing on ranked ladder, but uh, I'm not gonna be as focused on laddering up either, just of, of showing off and trying out some new decks here coming up in the future but uh, in the meantime like I said we have a little bit more adventure prank kids uh, some of these last games here in the duelist cup uh, overall I think the event was pretty good I liked it overall um, I just said that geez uh, the time limit again I I do see where it was a bit of an issue sometimes when games tend to go longer but I think ultimately it wasn't an issue overall um, I know I said earlier like oh I'd be fine with 300 seconds every single time I don't know maybe about that but I think for the the for the sake of the Duelist Cup, it was totally fine. Um, yeah, this event was cool, though. It would totally be down to do more stuff like this here in the future. So, um, it was nice to have a festival that wasn't just like a, a deck limit, you know, re restriction. Um, or at least, you know, a non-interesting one, which I do feel uh, the majority of them have been kind of not interesting. But, yeah, no, I, I'll, like I said, this, this uh, monthly event here, um, definitely one of the better ones in my opinion. So... All right, well, before we go ahead and go into these games, let's go ahead and break down the deck list here. We are playing two Prank Kids Fanzies, three Maxi, three Prank Kids Dropsies, three Ash Blossom Enjoy Spring, three Prank Kids Lampsies, two Water Enchantress of the Temple, one Destiny Hero Celestial, one Prank Kids Roxies, one Destiny Hero Dasher, one Wandering Griffin Rider, one Nibiru the Primal Being, one Foolish Burial, two Fusion Destiny, two Rite of Our Messier, one Dracoback the Rideable Dragon, Three Prank Kids Place, one Prank Kids Pranks, one Fateful Adventure, uh, two Call by the Grave, one Prank Kids Pandemonium, two Cross Out Designator, two Forbidden Droplet, and two Infinite Permanence. Extra deck will contain one Prank Kids Rocket Ride, one Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, one Prank Kids Battle Butler, one Totally Awesome, two Link Spider, two Prank Kids Meow Meow Moo, two Prank Kids Doodle Doodle Doo, one Prank Kids Bow Wow Bark, one Predator Plant Vert Anaconda, one Nightmare Unicorn, one Prank Kids Rip Roar and Roaster, and then finally one Access Code Talker. All right, so now that we've taken a look at the list, let's go ahead and take a look at some games now. All right, so this first game here is, oh shoot, it's the most recent one, or one of the most recent ones. I should remember what it is, but uh, I had it for a second. I thought I did before I started the game up, but alas, I did not. Oh yeah, no, this is a, good, a going second game, but this is one where we actually just opened like the god going second hand, right? Uh, we open Maxi, Ash, Droplet, and Imperm, and the Fusion Destiny is not bad to have an addition to all those either. Obviously, we'd like a Prank Kids card, but we'll definitely take what we can get. So, yeah, I wanted to talk about this first turn a little bit. This might have looked a little bit weird, especially given how the turn actually ended up playing out. Like, why did I throw out a Maxi in response to just a Quacky Mirror Guardian? So, I see the Quacky Mirror Guardian, and I actually am, you know... I'm familiar enough with Adamancipator to know that this is probably the start of an Adamancipator play. Um, and I know that oftentimes... Uh, Adam Spaders like to lead because like you want to get the guardian out as early as possible because it's kind of like your your hand trap uh, It's kind of like you're playing three more copies of cross that designator, but this one's got to be on the field That's kind of how I like to think of Kwaki guardian and Adam Spader. Um And I know that it's uh, a very common opening play to summon the guardian and then special summon uh, The researcher to then start excavating and go into plays I know because I've, I've played my fair share of Adam Spader. actually I'm thinking about playing it a little bit more because it seems to be uh, a bit on the rise again in terms of uh, uh, popularity and and play so I don't know if the deck's gotten stronger with new tech or if just people are Playing it and now it's the fair representation, but in any case so I'm expecting the, or I'm anticipating the possibility of them special summoning a researcher. That's why I wanted to throw out Maxi in response to the normal summon of the Guardian, because now they're left with a choice. They either have to let the sea resolve, 
Uh, and well, actually, they're offered three choices, right? They either use the Guardian in response to the C. That's actually ideal for me because it gets the Guardian off the board. I don't have to worry about it on my next turn, and they also can't special the Researcher. They don't use the Guardian and end their turn. That's totally fine with me. Or they don't use it and they can special summon the Researcher and continue drawing anyway. Also fine with me. Now, here we see that they actually end up ending the turn. And it's actually going to turn out because we will ultimately see what all their cards were, I believe. Uh, if I recall correctly, they actually don't have the researcher, so um, I did end up ultimately throwing out the maxi for quote unquote nothing, but it also still wasn't nothing because um, the idea that I threw it out for nothing, knowing retroactively that they don't have a researcher, is results oriented thinking. And that's definitely the kind of mentality that we want to avoid when evaluating our own gameplay. We want to ask ourselves did we make the best decision in the moment with the knowledge that we had? And I am of the opinion that in that moment, uh, with the knowledge that we had, it was correct to chain Maxi to response to the response of, uh, or rather, in response to the summon of Quacky Mirror Guardian. So, um, in any case, yeah, we didn't get a prank kid, but that's fine. We still have the Fusion Destiny, so we can establish the uh, DPE here. Um, yeah, they're going to chain the Cross Out Designator here, calling Droplet, which was kind of weird because they did have the Droplet in hand, but I don't know. I guess they were just calling a, a dead draw, like a card they didn't want to top deck. Would actually make sense uh, there. So. Unfortunately, due to how chain links work, because Droplet uh, was still on the board, we were still able to send it with a DPE, so we didn't have to pop our own Fateful Adventure here. So, um, yeah, we do get the DPE back, but they are going to have the Kaiju here, the string, humongous string Kaiju. Uh, so, yeah, then they activate Miracle Rupture. I did take a moment to decide if I want to try to Ash this. This felt like it's, it could be something that's Ash bait. Uh, the Miracle Rupture here, but I ultimately decided to negate it because they only have two cards remaining in their hand. I know that one of them is the Dragite because they revealed it with the Quacky Mirror Guardian, the um, the main deck Dragite, the level 4 one, and they only have one other card. I've got both Droplet and Imperm face down, so even if their last card is like an Adam Anspator, a uh, Tuner Monster that can start excavating, I can just negate it, and then um, even if they can then sink into like, like let's say they had Dragite and Seeker, right? The normal Dragite, Special Seeker, Activate Seeker, I can chain Imperm, negate the Seeker, even if they then sink into the Raptite, I can then use the Droplet to negate the Raptite excavate as well. Um, I would send the Kaiju here in that scenario, keeping the Fateful Adventure and the Draco back. That way on the next turn I could use Fateful Adventure, send the Water Enchantress, banish it, get the Rite of Armaseer, activate, activate Draco back, bounce the Reptite, and then have that be off the board. Um, so that's basically, and I, that sounds like, you know, kind of convoluted, but that's really how I like to plan out responses like this, like, you know, and this all traces back to ashing the rapture, or the rupture here, and this is why I'm fine with ashing the rupture here. You really do gotta plan out, like, as many steps ahead as possible, just thinking about, like, the worst case scenario, how it would play out, um, and then based on deciding how you would respond to the worst case scenario, then being like, okay, I'm fine making this play because even if things go totally wrong here, uh, we still have a play. Now, they actually end up going for a Gallant Granite, which wasn't a line that I necessarily considered. Uh, them having another, well, level 4 monster they could special summon alongside the Dragite. This is still fine, though, because I've still got the Air Prone and I've still got the Droplet. So, um, I mean, I figured having both of these cards, I'd be fine pretty much no matter what happened, but... Uh, um, this is still, you know, a more ideal scenario than the one where they have both Seeker into Raptite uh, with the Dragite there. Well, the other thing, too, is that in that scenario, the Dragite would have also gotten them a draw, which was a little bit of a, sh like, a wild card factor, but I was willing to deal with that because that is a fringe, um, outlier within an already fringe scenario, so I'm fine taking a risk on that because I don't think that's super likely to be something that's going to really mess me up, even if it actually plays out that the uh, Raptite gets summoned that way. So then, yeah, after that, the opponent concedes as they realize, you know, we can just go for it. I mean, I didn't actually have lethal there, but I had close enough to lethal. My opponent's in top deck mode. I've already got the droplet down still. Um, I have enough resources ahead of them that they um, just decided to go ahead and concede there. And actually, by bouncing the Gallant Granite with the Draco back specifically, uh, that actually prevents Block Dragon from being a viable top deck, which was my other plan there as well. So, um... Yeah, I wanted to show that game because it showed a lot of like little interesting interactions, uh, and also we hadn't seen Adam Emancipator in a long while, so always nice to see them again. All right, let's go and take a look at the next game. It's so weird with these Duelist Cup games. I know I keep mentioning this, but like I really like confirming the opponent's deck in other you know gameplay videos, just to at least talk a little bit about the matchup and also remind myself of what it was, but um, not the case here. So looks like we're taking the second turn here. 
Um, we've got the Nibiru and the Droplet, which is nice. Uh, looks like we are playing up against the Mirror Match, so I'm thinking about when is best to Nibiru. I guess the Mirror Match, it's hard because it kind of depends on the hand a little bit. Not just yours, but theirs as well. And obviously, we can't know their hands, so um, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking about Nibiruing. I'm trying to remember when I did actually end up Nibiruing here. It might have been in response to this prank kid summon, which I don't think is actually necessarily ideal. I think I maybe should have waited a little bit here. Yeah, I should have waited for them to commit the prank kid's pranks here. And I should have known that too, because I, I obviously I know that's an out to the Nibiru there. I kind of just gave them an opportunity to uh, out my Nibiru, which they actually didn't take. So I don't know if they just didn't have another prank kid's card in hand, or if they didn't play two Link Spiders, or if they didn't know that that's how you do it. But in any case here, we actually don't end up getting punished. But I should have waited for them to use the pranks and then Nibiru, um, because that makes it harder for them to follow up with DPE, I think, if I'm thinking of just things correctly. But whatever, in any case here. Um, yeah, so we've got the... Uh, call by here for the Ash. Oh, wait, I think I'm remembering this game now. Actually, I do remember this game now. <laughs> yeah, because I have the call by for the Ash, but they have their call by on my Lampsies. And I remember thinking, hmm, I remember thinking when my opponent did that, like, I wonder if they kind of know the implications of them doing that. Like, yeah, you stopped me from making plays, but you've also definitely stopped yourself from making a good amount of plays on the next turn. And I actually wondered, like, I wonder if the opponent is going to end up forgetting. And, uh, well, <laughs> we'll see how that ends, ends up playing out here in a bit. But in any case here, yeah, I can just run over the token and smack him with the Meow Meow Moo before going into the Vert for the DPE. Um, DPE always nice as a good just fallback play with this deck. It's always what it's used for, honestly. <laughs> it's, uh, um, just being able to fall back, like I said, on the DPE and have something, if nothing else. But here they actually have the Imperm uh, for my Vert Anaconda, so... I'm already thinking because they didn't use pranks to go into DPE during their turn after I Nibiru'd them, they probably don't have a Prank Kids monster in hand. <coughs> Excuse me, so, sorry about that. Anyway, they've got the Terraforming for the plays, so I'm like, okay, they do have some amount of plays, but are they going to be smart enough to dodge the, <laughs> the Lampsies? And they actually don't, they just straight up add the Lampsies. And at this point, I'm like, oh no, 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 this isn't what you want to do, come on. Ah, but alas, yeah. They go for it, they activate the Lampsies, and then sure enough, it ends up getting negated. So definitely want to make sure that we're remembering. I mean, I've done it before with Call By 2, I'm not going to pretend I've never done it before. Um, it's been a little while, admittedly, but uh, yeah, Call By does negate through the opponent's next turn. Uh, while Call By can be a very useful card, even in the Mirror Match, you do have to be mindful of that in the Mirror Match in particular. That's a uh, make sure you're not negating your own combo pieces as my opponent inadvertently end up doing here and the kind of the poetic I don't know about poetic justice is what I was about to say but kind of the irony of it all is that I actually have another Lampsies to follow up with which now call by's effect is worn off so now I like call by can actually uh, be used here so <laughs> go figure uh, they do have a maxi but I've also got an ash blossom here which ironically I also end up saving through to this turn because it got called by which is why I didn't end up using ash on their last turn either so in like two ways called by kind of like wrecked my opponent like multiple times over here I don't know it's just an interesting game so I figured I'd go ahead and show that one off just as a a cautionary tale again when using call by particularly in the mirror match not just prank kids but any mirror match like be mindful that you're not negating your own combo, or like that you're not stopping yourself by negating your own combo pieces, because that that will go through to your next turn as well if you do it during your opponent's turn. But uh, in any case, let's go and take a look at the next game. All right, got some more Duelist Cup action here. I'm gonna jump straight into it. See, I think we went first this game, if I recall correctly. Yes, we did. Okay. And we opened, well, I was going to call this like a god hand. It could be a little bit better. The place could be like a, uh, <laughs> like a called by or something here, um, or a cross out, but, um, you know, beggars can't be choosers, and we definitely don't mind them ashing the foolish here, um, at all, uh, because obviously that's going to free us up more or less, uh, unless they have a max C to do just about anything we want in terms of making plays and does not seem they have the max C so uh, I'm going to lead with the fanzies here uh, we've got two prank kids so we can go for the two prank kids line that is going to end on the rip horn roaster and the ability to make the battle butler on the next turn as well um, definitely I don't know if I would call it an underrated line but uh, I don't see 
as many decks running Rip Roar Notice Ray as I personally think should, so uh, definitely a line I like to show off here. Now, here they are going to have the Imperm for the Doodle Doodle Do, which is going to affect our play a little bit here. Uh, we're going to have to go for a... Um, not in like a less than optimal line, given the circumstance is going to end up being the optimal line, but uh, less than ideal, given the fact that we got Imperm. So, yeah, no longer going for um, the line there that we were going to before, which is... Um, the, the two Prankids line again because our Doodle Doodle Do got negated. Uh, we can't add all the things that we need and still have all the materials we need to make all the cards. We can, however, still make a DPE. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, DPE is ultimately going to most of the time just be kind of like your fallback play, right? Like it's going to be your, your backup, your go-to when uh, pretty much everything else you're doing gets stopped. Um, and it's one of the reasons that it's so powerful to include in the deck. Uh, it might seem weird that, like, you know, we're going so far out of our way to make so much space for something that's not even, like, a, a plan A, so to speak, but, um, it's definitely, like, the best plan B you could possibly have, honestly, as far as, far as, as, far as like, uh, additional engines go, and it's just a very minimal commitment to, you know, um, I mean, the four main deck slots is, you know, not mi super minimal, but it's, it's minimal enough, we can make room for it, so... I did think about ashing this Gamma here just to save my uh, DPE, but I ultimately decided that, you know, uh, I'm going to be able to go for game next turn anyway. I I'm very confident anyway because I've still got the Leak 2 Vert Anaconda on the field, and I've got the Adventure Token as well as multiple Prank Kids. So I actually want to save the Ash on the off chance that they do have a Max C now. Uh, it might seem like a bit of a niche scenario, but again, um, given what I have on board, I'm very confident I I'm not going to have much trouble going for Lethal here, so... Um, I wanted to kind of play into that as opposed to like a a more like quote unquote regular play that might have resulted in like a again a more typical prank kids line but not like necessarily like an OTK. Prank kids do have a bit of a time OTKing sometimes. I've noticed as opposed to like other meta decks which can kind of just vomit out 8,000 damage. Uh, it's not that prank kids can't do it. It's just that you got to work for it a little bit more, not much more, but a little bit more than other combo based decks. Um, from again my own personal observation there, but and we've already got the, I mean, the, the adventure line definitely helps, right? Getting the 4,000 damage just from those two cards alone, the adventure token and the wandering griffin rider there. And yeah, so here I'm going to use the Ver anaconda and that extra, extra lampsies there in order to go into nightmare unicorn just to make sure that I've got 8,000 damage on board. And then I'll even go for access code talker. I did think about just like trying to battle and then maybe going for access code like during main phase two, but I ultimately, like, I don't think it mattered too much, but I ultimately decided that access code was a little bit safer to go into and then go into battle phase, but um, ultimately it's not gonna matter. The opponent's just going to concede shortly after that. All right, let's go and take a look at the next game. Yeah, so these, I have to admit, these, uh. Last couple of games, I don't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't tell you anything about them. <laughs> just off the top of my head. Like, the other ones I saw, like, the turn count, and I, like, kind of remembered. Okay, so we do have a going second game here. Uh, looks like we're opening C and Droplet, so definitely can't complain about that. Uh, ah, yeah, so playing up against uh, Adventure of Phantom Knights. So given that they normal summon... Okay, yeah, I totally remember this game now. Um, yeah, so given that they normal summon the Phantom Knights' uh, Bragged Gloves, it's not an off idea to assume that they're just going to special summon, not even necessarily Silent Boots, but any number of level 3 extenders, because a lot of them do require you to have like some kind of level 3 monster on the board. So uh, if my opponent is normal summoning a Phantom Knights monster, uh, that's one of those scenarios where I'm actually fine popping off Max C just in response to something that isn't inherently going to get me a draw, like it isn't inherently like a special summon. Um, and then the opponent, like I said, they set two and they just ultimately pass. So even though I didn't draw any cards off of the max C, the C has done its job. Discard this card, force your opponent to end their turn, more or less. Uh, they do still get to set cards, but uh, more or less force your opponent to pass their turn is definitely something that is a-okay by me, especially given this hand. Uh, you know, we've got the Fusion Destiny for backups, the Prank Kids, and we have a Fateful Adventure as well, so... Let's see what we end up top decking here. Looks like it is going to be a Water Enchantress. That's even better. Because uh, now we can go for the Adventure Line to try to set the Griffin before um, we even have to fully commit. Whereas with the Adventure by itself, we get the token, but not the Griffin here. So, actually, something kind of interesting that I noted here. Uh, I thought about this, right? I'm thinking, okay, it's Phantom Knights, right? And they set two cards before ending. Given that it's Phantom Knights, it's actually really reasonably likely that one of these is Fogblade. So, 
what I did here was I went to this uh, little, you know, information thing here, this little clipboard, and if you look at the actual, I actually saw this in a comment like a while ago, I should, I, I wish I'd paid attention to who actually said it so I could shout you out for pointing this out, because I didn't know this for the longest time, but when your opponent sets back row, right, you can actually look at the position in this little circle. It's, it's if you're not looking for it, it's it's really hard to notice. And I wish they did a better job of pointing this out. But uh, you can actually see which zone they set each card to. So this middle card was the first one set my, by my opponent, and then this one was the second. Given that, like, I don't know, this ultimately doesn't really matter. It is, at the end of the day, going to be a 50-50 decision, which one I'm going to end up bouncing with the Draker back is where I'm going here. Because, like I said, I want to get rid of the Fog Blade even before I summon the Griffin, if possible, just to make sure that um, it's not going to mess me up and that I can more easily go for game. So, I kind of suspect that their first face down is probably the Fog Blade if they did, in fact, set a Fog Blade. Because um, it's going to be the more useful one. It's, like, the one that you want on the board more. It's just kind of like... I don't know, that, again, not everyone does it, but that tends to, in my experience, seem to be how most people's subconscious work when it comes to setting back row. Um, if you think your opponent might also play around it, like if you know your opponent well enough, I guess, you could also pick the other card in anticipation of them, maybe anticipate something like that. That's very, very fringe, but like, I play around that, so, you know, it's not like the most fringe thing in the world. I mean, it's very, very fringe, but... Um, yeah, so any anyway, now we start going into the regular Prank Kids line. Our opponent does have an Abiru, which is very scary, but we fortunately have the Crossout Designator. So, um, given that we're able to go through the Adventure line and also still have the Griffin up along with the token, uh, the opponent just gives it to us at that point, which, to be fair, we pretty much had the game anyway at that point. All right, let's take a look at uh, next game here. All right, so between games there, I had a little bit of weirdness, so hopefully... Yeah, I'm seeing like some weird on the capture. Huh, I wonder if that's gonna actually show up in the video. We'll have to see. You might see some like weird lines. I don't know if that's actually been the case the whole time or if that's just now the case. Huh, I hope that hasn't been the case the whole time. Well, anyway. Yeah, so here we have, uh, it's an all right hand. We got, I mean, multiple prank kids place isn't actually that great because that means, that doesn't mean we can, it's uh, necessarily two prank kids line. Uh, it just kind of still means that we can only do one, because obviously you can only use Crank Kids Play Searching Effect once per turn, so... Um, that is, I guess, a little bit of a drawback between... Or rather, as a result of running, um... Uh, three Place, as opposed to more Prank Kids, but... I mean, it, it happens so, so rarely. I, I don't think it's worth, like... I don't think it's enough of a reason, rather, to not play, um... Three place. I still think a three prank kids place, and then less of the actual prank kids is. It tends to be the way to go. I just like the versatility of it, and again, being able to use place to potentially bait not against most people, but potentially bait, or if not bait, at least check for Ash Blossom is still uh, very very useful. So yeah, just going for a ver fairly standard one prank kids line here. Um, yeah, I feel like games like this are still nice to show because it's good to have refreshers. I'll still see comments every now and then of like, um, you know, how to do a combo with certain, uh, you know, certain numbers of cards in hands, or just in general how to play the deck. Uh, if you are ever wondering about stuff like that, oh, and actually we got really, really lucky with the cross out designators here by drawing that extra one. At first I was like, oh, I didn't need that extra designator, but actually because we had that extra one, we could set one and then still have one in hand to hit the Nibiru with here. So. Um, Actually, that's another good choke point. Actually, that's kind of why I wanted to save this game, I remember now, because that, that shows off a pretty decent choke point against Nibiru. Um, or rather, by utilizing Nibiru, is right there during the uh, the end of the main phase. Um, because one, I've already used Prank's effect, so it, I have a much harder time going into DPE, and then two, it kind of plays around Crossout Designator, because most people, like myself, will set Crossout Designator if they haven't used it during their turn to potentially hit a commonly used card during the opponent's turn. And of course, now I totally forgot what point I had a point earlier, right before I, I decided to tangent uh, or go into that tangent there. But um, yeah, because I was talking about playing three place and minimal prank kids. Ah, I'm not gonna remember. Well, whatever. It's not that big of a deal. Oh, so yeah, we're just going for the butler here. Um, again, pretty standard prank kid stuff. Of course, now getting all three of our. 
prank kids. I'm gonna use the dropsies last year. Well, I guess I have the place, so it doesn't really matter. But um, if I didn't have prank kids place in play, I still would want to activate the prank kids effects in that order because I like to quote unquote chain block with the dropsies. Um, not that the opponent usually ashes in a scenario like that or negates that effect in general, but um, you know, ideally you like to get out the two dropsies, uh, if nothing else, with the prank kids that you're activating when you're fusing with Battle Builder so that you can go into the totally awesome, or at least at the very least, uh, threaten to go into the totally awesome uh, during your opponent's next turn there, so. Alright, so yeah, the Sangin, <laughs> Normal Summon Sangin into Almirage into uh, the Crusade Aboria does confirm that it is going to be, in fact, the uh, quote-unquote adventure pile, which is actually a deck that I do... Uh, Firmly plan on building now. I know I've said recently that I would like to try it or that I am interested in trying it But no, I do uh, pretty firmly plan on playing the deck there. So at some point uh, Ideally in the near future the very near future, but uh, I do have another new deck that I want to try as well But that's all stuff for future videos. So um, yeah, the cross that doesn't for me It looks like it's gonna be enough to get the opponent to concede there. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the uh, outro now Okay, everybody, thank you so much for watching all the way to the very end. I greatly appreciate that, and I greatly appreciate those of you who are also commenting and subscribing. Um, those things all not only mean a lot to me personally, but are great ways of supporting the channel. Uh, comments, love to hear the feedback on uh, gameplays, deck building, just the videos in general. I, I thrive on constructive criticism, and you guys are very, very good about giving that. Um, plus, you know, like a, a point I've often emphasized recently is that community-based learning is the best kind of learning. So um, by offering you know the suggestions and tips on my gameplay, you're not only helping me improve my own gameplay, but everybody else as well um, improve theirs by learning the optimal lines. So yeah, now that the Duelist Cup games are more or less out of the way for me, um, I definitely, like I said, plan on building some new decks, trying those out for the channel, and uh, going and revisiting some decks I uh, haven't played yet this season, so we'll be seeing more of that in the future, but for now, this is Xlex, signing out. Hope you guys have a fantastic day.